Chairs, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the uh, organizing committee for the uh, invitation to come and uh, talk about uh, cholangiocarcinoma, particularly with a focus on uh, targeted agents. These are my disclosures. So we've not yet had a cholangiocarcinoma session, so by way of uh, introduction, we are talking about a heterogeneous group of tumors uh, which arise within the liver, uh, so-called intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, uh, those uh, adjacent to the hilum, the perihylar tumors, as well as extrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. Biliary tract cancers also include gallbladder uh, adenocarcinoma, uh, and in, in some uh, series, uh, and probably of uh, Varta tumors as well. They're predominantly adenocarcinomas. Uh, we know that they carry a poor prognosis. And unfortunately, the vast majority of patients present with advanced disease with uh, less than a third amenable to curative surgery. We also know that because of emerging treatment options for uh, HCC, in fact, a diagnosis of uh, cholangiocarcinoma carries a more lethal uh, prognosis than HCC itself. And I've just taken the uh, NCCN guidelines for intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma to uh, just flag uh, the standards of care uh, in 2015. So clearly for patients who present with resectable disease, uh, primary treatment is uh, surgery, and uh, there is to date no firm recommendation that can be made uh, regarding uh, adjuvant chemotherapy or adjuvant radiotherapy to that, for that matter. For patients who present with uh, unresectable disease or metastatic disease, uh, the best evidence that we currently have, category one evidence, is uh, in favor of systemic chemotherapy, specifically platinum and gemcitabine based, although other chemotherapy options uh, may be considered. Delighted to see here that we can also uh, enroll patients ideally into a clinical trial, uh, and there are a number of local regional therapies that may also uh, be considered. Having said that, with uh, systemic therapies, uh, the magnitude of benefit in terms of survival is modest, and patients survive uh, just under a year on average. So there is an urgent need uh, to identify new treatment options. With respect to the different ways that cancer can be uh, targeted, uh, I'm going to focus on two particular uh, sets of pathways, so the EGFR inhibitors uh, and VEGF inhibition, both of which have got, uh, I guess, the most mature data uh, that we can present. I'll then also talk about some of the emerging uh, molecular signatures that are uh, uh, being understood for biliary tract cancers and highlight some ongoing studies which are looking uh, to target some of those uh, new pathways or underlying signatures. So EGFR inhibition in itself doesn't need much introduction, but just to tell you what the role is in um, biliary tract cancer. EGFR uh, expression is increased in the majority of uh, gallbladder and bile duct cancers, and it looks that this is in part driven by the TGF uh, ligand. Bile uh, acids activate EGFR and cellular proliferation via what appears to be a TGF-dependent uh, mechanism in cholangiocarcinoma cell lines. We also know that sustained EGFR inhibition has been demonstrated in cholangiocarcinoma and that blocking this in vitro uh, does appear to have an anti-tumor effect. So based on that promising, uh, sorry, based on that uh, preclinical work, a very promising uh, single arm phase two study uh, was published a few years ago, uh, which really looked to uh, maybe provide a step change in the management of biliary tract cancer. In this study, patients received GEMOX combination, gemcitabine and oxaliplatin with the addition of uh, cetuximab, and you can see that the uh, response rates were very impressive uh, with a complete response rate of 10%, uh, PR of 53%, with two-thirds of patients responding to treatment. I think one of the important lessons that we learned from that study is in fact nine patients, or 30%, uh, went on to have uh, potentially curative resection uh, after a major response to treatment. However, the results of a subsequent randomized phase two study uh, did not confirm that early enthusiasm. So in the bingo study, uh, 150 patients were randomized to receive either a Gemox combina combination alone or Gemox with the addition of cetuximab uh, as per the previous study. 
The primary endpoint of the study was four-month progression-free survival, and you can see here that numerically there was an improvement with the addition of cetuximab. However, if you look at some of the other outcome uh, measures, there was no improvement in progression-free survival, uh, response rate, uh, or overall survival. And in fact, that is one of three uh, randomized studies that we had prior to this year. Uh, I've put each one of them in a row. So the, the bingo study is the top one. And you can see that uh, the addition of the biological didn't appear to improve the response rate. Uh, the uh, median PFS was very similar. And there was no obvious improvement in the median overall survival. There was another study looking at cetuximab, again with Gemox. This did show an improvement in response rate, uh, some improvement in medium progression-free survival, uh, and maybe overall survival, although this was not statistically significant. And there was an allotinib study which was negative, again, with an improvement in response rate, uh, but without the improved uh, survival measures. And just for reference, we've put in here the uh, response rate that we saw with cisplatin and gemcitabine, uh, as well as the median progression-free survival and median overall survival. So with all the limitations of cross-trial comparison, it doesn't appear that we are getting a major increment uh, in terms of addition of EGFR inhibition with, uh, uh, with efficacy. The studies have also tried to uh, uh, evaluate at least uh, what the correlation is with respect to EGFR uh, overexpression as well as KRAS mutation analysis. Just to highlight, all of these studies uh, took unselected patients, uh, so they were not selected with respect to KRAS uh, status. Uh, all of them were unselected. Uh, the last one was stratified by uh, RAS status. But in fact, the studies have consistently found uh, no correlation between uh, KRAS mutation status and no correlation with EGFR uh, overexpression. One of the criticisms has been that maybe uh, we shouldn't be selecting patients uh, and with all comers. Uh, the problem has been in that we need to specifically focus on patients with uh, KRAS wild type tumors. So this year has moved us on in that respect. Two studies have done exactly that. Uh, this study presented at ASCO uh, looked at the addition of panitumumab to uh, cisplatin and gemcitabine. It was a randomized phase two study run by the German group. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, amongst 91 patients, there was no improvement in six-month progression-free survival, which was the primary endpoint. And you can see here the Kaplan-Meier curves for progression-free survival and overall survival. In fact, the panitumumab arm is in blue uh, on both of these curves. So clearly, it doesn't seem to be any uh, improvement by the addition of panitumumab to that combination. I'm very grateful to Dr. Marino for making available the, um, uh, the slides from uh, a poster that was presented earlier today at this meeting. Uh, this is an Italian study which was then adding panitumumab uh, to gemcitabine and oxaliplatin combination, again in a randomized phase two uh, design. Patients, again, like the previous study, were selected by being wild-type KRAS patients only. The primary endpoint was progression-free survival. And unfortunately, you can see that uh, the, the curves for PFS and overall survival uh, were, uh, didn't show any uh, improvement, and the study did not meet its primary endpoint. You can also see uh, that the study did include patients with intrahepatic, extrahepatic, and, and gallbladder cancers. And there was uh, an interesting finding in that patients with uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma subgroup uh, did appear to have uh, a, a longer survival, although the numbers are relatively small, and I think we must uh, exercise caution when looking at that individual result. So is EGFR uh, inhibition still worth pursuing? Well, we have learned a few things. We can't extrapolate the lessons that we've learned from other tumor types uh, to biliary tract cancer. So lessons from colorectal cancer, for example, are not transferable with respect to EGFR overexpression or KRAS status. One of the difficulties we have with biliary tract cancer is, in fact, we're now dealing with uh, small studies and limited statistical power when trying to evaluate uh, any correlations. We also know from other types of uh, cancer that chemotherapy partner may matter uh, in that irinotecan may be a preferable uh, partner uh, to the EGFR inhibition than oxaliplatin or 5-FU may be preferable to capcitabine. So I think for EGFR inhibition currently, this remains investigational. 
I think it would be difficult to uh, support an additional study, uh, but it may be worth considering a pooled analysis of the studies that have already been performed and maybe particular detailed evaluation of patients who did appear to have uh, exceptional responses in order to understand a little bit more about wh why those patients did particularly well. If I can move on to VEGF uh, inhibition, uh, cholangiocarcinoma, you remember, arises in um, uh, bile duct uh, cells uh, and within the liver in terms of uh, embryology, uh, both blood vessels and uh, bile ducts are the formation of tubular structures within the same uh, organ. And in fact, VEGF uh, is linked in uh, with the development of um, bile ducts in the first place. We also know that in terms of repair and remodeling, uh, hepatic progenitor cells regenerate, so generate reactive uh, cholangiocytes, and that there is an impact of hypoxia-driven VEGF and PDF changes, although this predominantly uh, applies to hepatocellular carcinoma rather than cholangiocarcinoma. It has been shown that uh, in established disease, cholangiocytes regain the ability uh, to produce a response to uh, VEGFA and VEGFC, and this is largely modulated by uh, PDGF. So there is a good rationale uh, for considering VEGF. And then looking at some of the uh, clinical data, uh, VEGF is overexpressed in 40 to 75% of biliary tract cancers. Not only is it the, the ligand, but the receptors are also overexpressed in the adjacent endothelium. And such expression is associated with increased risk of metastases, a reduced microvessel density, and reduced uh, overall survival. Our interest has been in sidirinib, which is a pan-VEGF uh, receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitor, and I'll talk more about that uh, in a minute. There have already been three studies, uh, which are single arm, looking at various inhibitors. Uh, sorafenib, uh, erlotinib in combination with bevacizumab, and bevacizumab in combination with uh, Gemox. Remember, all of these were single arm uh, phase two studies. The authors from the sorafenib study uh, in which uh, out of 46 patients, 20 were treatment naive, concluded that this agent had low activity based on a low response rate of 2% and an overall survival of 4.4 months only. A bit more interestingly, the bevacizumab and elotinib arm, uh, which had 48 untreated patients out of 53, so it's predominantly a first-line study, uh, showed a 12% uh, response rate but an intriguing 9.9-month .9 uh, overall survival, and the authors concluded the combination may be a therapeutic alternative. And in the last study, um, the uh, addition of bevacizumab uh, is one of the studies that's been able to push survival beyond uh, 12 months, but this was predominantly a study looking at the predictive value of um, PET scanning, uh, and they were able to demonstrate that the uh, changes in SUV max were correlated with PFS and overall survival. But moving on to randomized phase two studies, which may be able to give us a little bit more information, uh, earlier last year saw the publication of a randomized study of gemcitabine with or without sorafenib uh, given at the full dose of uh, 400 milligrams uh, twice a day. Unfortunately, that study also uh, failed to show an improvement in progression-free survival, did not show an improvement in overall survival, and the response rates were very similar. And some of the translational uh, work uh, is there and can be built on with some of the subsequent uh, VEGF-targeted studies. But I think one of the important lessons that this particular study showed uh, is that due to toxicity, the treatment duration wasn't only uh, shortened for serafinib, but there were fewer dose adjustments and treatment interruptions uh, in the placebo group. So we need to be very mindful of the agents that we're using and make, making sure that we can deliver them and we can deliver them in a sustained manner. We've learned the same lesson from the ABCO3 study uh, where we were adding uh, sidirinib uh, or placebo to the standard chemotherapy of cisplatin and gemcitabine. The results presented at ASCO last year and currently in press uh, showed that the study failed to meet its primary endpoint, which was to improve the median progression-free survival. But there were some interesting hints that may suggest that VEGF inhibition is still worth pursuing. We did see an improvement in objective response rate, and that was usually done at the first scan, which was done at three months. Uh, you can also see that the, at this point, the curves separate and quickly come back together again, 
noting that the median time on treatment for sildenafil was only 4.6 months, and most patients had to stop treatment because of toxicity. And soon after, any uh, transient effect was then lost. We observed a 10% absolute difference at six-month progression-free survival, uh, which appeared to translate into a uh, one-year survival, also 10% difference. Encouragingly, the placebo arm behaved exactly as we would expect it, so just under a year, and patients receiving the, the combination of sidereal with chemotherapy had a median overall survival of 14.1 months. VEGFR2 appears to uh, be predictive for poor survival, with higher levels uh, having a reduced uh, survival in what appears to be a, a dose-dependent manner. And we were also able to present at ASCO this year some of the longitudinal biomarker data, which suggests that we're having an on-target treatment with sidereal with reduction in VEGFR2, as well as TI2. But also importantly, we found that patients who died in less than a year uh, tended to have higher levels of VEGFR2 and higher levels of TI2, uh, with all the limitations of the error bars that you can see. So moving on from EGF and VEGF, we are now uh, understanding a little bit better some of the molecular background and molecular heterogeneity of biliary tract cancers. So in this particular series, uh, looking at mutational uh, profiling of biliary tract cancers, uh, you can see that they included 40 patients with intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, uh, 20 extrahepatic cholangios, and 25 uh, gallbladder cancers. And just to highlight some differences, so you can see that IDH1 uh, mutations uh, appear to occur only in cholangiocarcinoma and not in gallbladder cancer. And in gallbladder cancer, you do seem to have uh, some very different uh, mutational signatures. You may remember uh, the uh, Krebs cycle uh, in which uh, isocitrate is converted to alpha-ketoglutarate. Uh, and uh, one of the problems with an IDH1 mutation is that you get over-accumulation of 2-hydroxyglutarate, uh, and this, uh, in turn, has an impact on trans transcriptional regulation, uh, proliferation, differentiation, angiogenesis, and the other uh, downstream targets that you can see there. And this is not a new finding in terms of oncology. We know that this has been linked with uh, gliomas, uh, certain types of uh, AML, uh, sarcomas, and now uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. So we've looked at cholangiocarcinoma versus gallbladder cancer. In fact, if you then split cholangiocarcinomas, there are also differences between intrahepatic and extrahepatic in that the IDH1 mutations seem to be uh, preferentially occurring in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas and not in extrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas, where KRAS and P53 seem to be uh, much, more, uh, much more prominent. And at ASCO, there was uh, this uh, series uh, presented by um, uh, Ross and colleagues, uh, which looked at a comprehensive genomic profiling, but not only looking at just genomic alterations, but clinically relevant uh, genomic alterations for which potentially we would have uh, a therapy to uh, address that individual target. And some interesting observations uh, are that there are some uh, mutations that appear to occur in all types of biliary tract cancer. Uh, CDK and 2A, which is involved in cycle site regulation, as well as ARID 1A, which is linked in with chromatin remodeling. There are some that are particular features of intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma and appear to be exclusively so, such as FGFR fusion rearrangements and IDH1 mutations. Intriguingly, uh, some uh, amplifications like uh, OB2 appear to happen more frequently uh, in extrahepatic, uh, but more so with gallbladder cancers. And KRAS mutations seem to be exclusively in extrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas. We also now know that liver fluke related cholangiocarcinomas are different to non liver fluke related, and maybe that in time will also. Uh, give us some uh, instructions on how to manage those individual patients. There are a number of emerging and ongoing uh, clinical uh, trials, which are predominantly phase one, two, looking at targeting some of the, uh, the targets that uh, I've, I've just highlighted. So just to sum up, uh, we certainly need to improve systemic treatments for patients with biliary tract cancer. 
EGFR targeting has so far failed to deliver a clear incremental change and uh, we need to learn uh, lessons where we can from patients who did respond. I think the VEGF axis remains a suitable pathway for further investigation, but particularly with better tolerated agents. Previously, by necessity, we have pooled biliary tract cancers into one group, uh, but applying genomic technology and molecular classification may now be untangling these, and it may then uh, allow us uh, to uh, be able to design rational uh, clinical studies looking at individual targets. And I think to my final point is just to encourage all colleagues to uh, collaborate because these are rare tumors in efficient clinical trial designs. Thank you very much.